introduction to philosophy and theory live stream lecture. My name is Julian. Hello to everybody joining us on YouTube and here on Instagram. Today, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Freudian theory of the uncanny, or das Unheimliche, Zizek's theory of Epur si muove, which translates to and yet it moves, some thoughts on the dialectic, the Kantian versus Hegelian metaphysical insight, and the relationship between desire and drive. All that and more in the next 45 minutes. But first of all, it is so wonderful to be back here in Spokane, Washington, after a journey to New York City and DC. I'm absolutely exhausted and yet invigorated in the way that only a city can invigorate you. I've I have gone to so many concerts and performances and bookstores and record stores and spoken to so many interesting people. And I return to my study, to my workplace, uh, with a sense of renewed urgency and inspiration. And I really hope that this lecture can provide you with the exact same feeling. My, my dream, my desire is to take these really difficult or seemingly abstract conceptual ideas and to hopefully make them relatable and accessible to you in a way that will enrich your own learning and study. I personally believe that learning and education should be available to everyone. I don't believe in gatekeeping. I don't believe that we should make this something that you have to go to university for. And so my goal with this lecture series is to provide you with an introduction to some of the key ideas within philosophy, so-called continental philosophy, psychoanalysis, um, art, the arts, literature, what have you, and to do it in a way that's hopefully respecting your intelligence, that doesn't unnecessarily dumb it down or simply turn it into content. Now, the only way that I can do this is because I am patron funded. So I would like to hereby give a huge thank you to our community of patrons from around the world who allow me to continue making these videos, who allow me to keep teaching and lecturing online independently. And on behalf of everybody who gets to enjoy these lectures for free, including myself, who enjoys teaching them, thank you to our community of patrons. And if you're not a patron, I would invite you to join us on Patreon, where I host a weekly Q&A right after the lecture. So you can ask me anything on the Q&A, and I will answer it and then release it as a podcast for patrons. Plus... I also want to have a brief announcement that my ebook, which is titled Spurious Infinities, The Cultural Logic of Post-Postmodernism, which is a book on Zizek's critique of postmodernism, is available for two more weeks on Patreon. That means that after two weeks, the book will disappear. It's a subscription service where every three months you can download a new ebook based on the previous lecture series that I've been teaching. So if you'd like to access my ebook and by doing so help me continue my dream of providing open access philosophical education to everyone, please consider becoming a patron today at www.patreon.com forward slash Jenneline and Julian. Now, if you're joining me this morning, it is 8 a.m. here on the West Coast. If you're joining me this morning, I would really appreciate it if you dropped a comment letting me know where you're joining me from. It, there's truly nothing that gives me more joy than knowing that we are a community of like-minded thinkers gathering together around the world for an hour of psychoanalysis and philosophy. I see Buenos Aires. Good morning, Buenos Aires. That sounds wonderful and very exotic. I wish I were there and not here. Uh, London. Hello to London. I actually lived in London for many, many years and for a while thought that would be the place that I would live forever. I used to work uh, in London at City University, and then I commuted from London to Oxford to work at Oxford Brooks. Uh, hello to Cologne in Germany. Very much missing all the Cologne markets. The Bronx, hello New York, Ireland, Illinois, Nigeria, Romania, Bali. We're all a little bit jealous. Uh, Seattle, that's very, very cool. I'll be in Seattle soon. Kurdistan, I do know where it is. Yes, hello Kurdistan. Uh, Philippines, Istanbul, Turkey. I also used to live in Istanbul. Kazakhstan, that's incredible. Uh, thank you guys so much. I really, really appreciate that. Um, okay, so today we have a whole bunch of things that I want to cover. Um, keep in mind that these ideas are part of a lecture series. And so if you'd like to access the full series, please do consider downloading them on Patreon, where you can find all of my lectures. It's more than 
200 lectures at this point. Um, but if you're a total beginner, fret not. This should still hopefully be something that you can piece together and that will allow you to engage in further reading. So I want to start with one of my favorite ideas, an idea that I think is just wonderfully useful when it comes, for example, to studying art or cinema. Like if you're an enthusiast uh, when it comes to horror movies, then this is a theory that will really work for you, I think. And this is the Freudian theory of the uncanny or das Unheimliche. In fact, if you're interested in starting to read some Freud, which I would highly recommend because Freud is a very engaging writer. You know, the author Stefan Zweig, one of my favorite writers, uh, once said that, who was a, a friend of Freud's, said that Freud was perhaps the, um, one of the best literary figures of his age, who yet nevertheless were never considered as authors as such. Now, a negative interpretation of that quote would be to say that Stefan Zweig was essentially saying that Freud wasn't practicing science, that he was simply making it up, that it was a beautiful kind of fiction. And yet in Stefan Zweig's admiration, he means almost the exact opposite, which is that Freud was able to infuse his psychoanalytic work with a kind of literary quality that made it transcend other more dry forms of scientific engagement. <clears throat> now, if you're interested in getting into Freud, I would recommend the short volume called The Uncanny or das Unheimliche. And one of the key features of the uncanny, which you'll recognize from horror movies, is that the uncanny describes something that makes your, sends a shiver down your spine. Something that is, that seems wrong somehow. Not outright horrific or spooky, but something which makes us distinctly uncomfortable. Now, one of the features of the uncanny, for there are quite a few, is something which moves, which definitely should not move. Think about, for example, a scene in, um, uh, oh, I forget what it's called. Oh, it's, the, it's the movie remake uh, with Will Smith. Someone needs to remind me here, where Will Smith is fighting like vampire zombies in a post-apocalyptic city. Someone please in the comments help me. There's a wonderful Will Smith movie where he's roaming the streets of New York and it's a post-apocalyptic space. And so the city is already uncanny. There is nobody in the city, a city that is defined by its constant movement. The city which never sleeps is now suddenly completely empty like a wasteland. And what's really key here is that one of the ways in which Will Smith copes with his day-to-day -day life as the last man on earth is that he has a mannequin that he's put into a movie rental store and he humanizes the mannequin. In other words, every morning he goes to the store and he talks to the mannequin as if, oh, thank you, the movie is I Am Legend. Yes, I Am Legend. So the movie I Am Legend, Will Smith, lacking human interaction, has a mannequin that he corresponds with. So he walks into the store and says something like, hello, good morning, how are you? He's therefore imitating the human interaction which is pleasant and kind of wholesome in a way. It's almost like uh, the volleyball Wilson and Cast Away where Tom Hanks, uh, Tom, Tom, Hanks, Tom Hanks humanizes the volleyball. Now, one of the spookiest sequences in I Am Legend has nothing to do with vampires or monsters. It's a scene in which Will Smith is walking across the street and suddenly sees the mannequin that is supposed to be in the store standing out in the street. And the mannequin isn't moving. The mannequin is simply there. And it's the kind of scene that makes your skin crawl. It's incredibly uncanny because this lifeless puppet seems to have moved itself out into the street. And it's a key psychological breakdown moment within I Am Legend, where Will Smith goes into hysterics he suddenly becomes paranoid. He's being watched. Someone has moved the mannequin. Or is the mannequin real? Is he losing his mind? And it's a really great scene to watch. You should watch it on YouTube. Will Smith, instead of simply panicking, really has like an existential crisis. Like I think tears run down his face. This is the uncanny. Something which is out of place. Something which moves, even though it should not move. And thereby seems to completely distort reality. It's a very deeply unnerving sensation by which what is real and what is not real seems to crumble. We can also see 
different versions of the uncanny, of course, functioning when it comes to zombies, right? What is more uncanny than something which is supposed to be dead and becomes alive? This theme of something which moves that should not move is, of course, also something that exists within more beautiful, more human moments. Think about, for example, if you are a woman who is going to have a baby, there is something inside of you that you can feel kicking. Here we have an element of the uncanny that emerges in a seemingly beautiful, deeply human enriching experience, which is something inside of you that is lashing out. Hence also why within horror movies, we have a distinct kind of body horror that relates to the sensation of something being there that cannot be accessed. Now, what's so interesting about the uncanny, however, is that the uncanny isn't simply something which moves which shouldn't move. It's not simply, for example, an object that has been displaced. Instead, it's about the element or the concept of displacement itself. I'll give you an example of this. Um, there's uh, a wonderful scene in the uh, Tales of Hoffman opera. Now, for context, Freud actually himself writes about the Tales of Hoffman when it comes to the uncanny. For example, one of the beautiful examples that Freud uses about the Tales of Hoffman is a blind man. So there's two men who are in a duel and one of them stabs, they're in a fight, and one of them blinds the other man. And the other man seeking vengeance follows him. Now here we already have an uncanny concept, which is how can you be followed by someone who is blind? If they cannot see you, then what it is, what is it exactly that is driving them forward? Now this in and of itself is spooky and yet not distinctly uncanny. You can be followed by a blind person. They could hear you, they could intuit where you are. However, the key sequence here for the Tales of Hoffman is that the man, seeking to evade his blind avenger, goes up into a church tower. He goes up to the very top of the tower so that he can survey the square below. And in surveying the square below, he feels like he has dominance. After all, there's no way that the blind man can see him all the way up on the tower. And so the man has gained an advantage. And this is where the uncanny, horrific, conclusion of the story enters, which is, of course, that as the man has this God eyes, God's eye view on the people on the square, the town square, all walking around like ants, at that exact point, the blind man turns and in a kind of horrific slow motion points up at the tower and starts screaming or moaning, like invasion of the body snatches, like, <sighs> and that is the uncanny, right? It's this moments in which the blind man knows exactly where the other man is hiding. That moment of the inversion of something which sees which should not be able to be seen, something which moves which should not be able to move. Now, again, I was going to go back to the tales of Hoffman to explain here that it's not just a concept about something which is spooky. It's also, if you will, a certain dialectical concept. And I'll explain in a moment what I mean by this. Now, another story within the Tales of Hoffman, which we can find within the opera, the Tales of Hoffman, has to do with a beautifully, almost funny sequence in which we have a wind-up doll girl, an automata, who appears to be, if you will, a robotic performer, a robotic opera singer. And so she is wound up and then she begins to sing and she sings beautifully. It's like the most beautiful song emitting from the hollow tubes that exist within this mechanical edifice. And what's key here is that at a certain point within the song, she gets stuck. There is some malfunction. And what should be the high octave, beautiful, sort of cathartic moment of her singing becomes something horrific, something deeply uncanny, which is that her voice gets stuck and her body gets stuck. And like a wind-up doll that is experiencing mechanical failure begins to jerk like this. And her voice jerks. And suddenly what was supposed to be a sublime emanation of this beautiful human song suddenly becomes a kind of horrific needle scratch of the repetition, the pure repetition of her, of her own like repetition, her own mechanical failure. Now what's key here from a Freudian perspective is that the uncanny is therefore not simply uncanny because it allows us to see something moving which does not move, 
instead of what makes the uncanny deeply uncomfortable is precisely that it is the moment at which we find not the failure within what appeared to be perfect, in other words, not the revealing of the true mechanical nature of the fastest mile of, fastest mile of woman, but instead it's the other way around. It's precisely that it reveals a inner, an inner truth about human activity as such, which is that underneath all human activity lies precisely this empty core of pure repetition, or what Freud called Wiederholungszwang, repetition compulsion. In other words, it's not simply that we've seen through the robot, the automata, and she's revealed her true nature, like the mask slipping off and we see only, instead of eyeballs, we see like um, uh, robotic features underneath. Instead, it's precisely that it presents us with a mirror, that fundamentally we are all like puppets. We are all like automata experiencing mechanical failure. That what we experience as human life isn't the pure movement of instincts by which we act in accordance with our nature, but that what makes us most human, most alive, is precisely our failure to act in accordance with instinct. Our failure to act in a manner that corresponds to our own expectations about who we would like to be. And that therefore there's a kind of uncanny element within all light, it's life itself. That human life becomes human when it is stuck. That this stuckness, this repetition, this impossibility of truly playing the role that is expected of you is not a failure to be human, but precisely the inner core of humanity as such. Here we can see something really interesting with relation to, to instinct, right? Humanity does not begin when we take ordinary instinct, like animalistic instinct, and we elevate it to a higher plane of existence. For example, it's not simply to say, well, the instinct that we have is to procreate, to sleep, and to eat. And now we found very luxurious ways of procreating, sleeping, and eating. It's not that the mattress is the highest form of the instincts to lie down on the ground on the ground in the grass. Instead, human life and humanity begins precisely at the moment when instinct is no longer functioning properly. When we become detached from the quote unquote natural flow of how we ought to be doing things. There is nothing more human than to resist the urge to sleep when you really ought to go to bed. There's nothing more human than to force yourself into a diet when you're hungry. There's nothing more human than to force yourself into a relationship that you don't really want to be in. In other words, rather than seeing humanity or the human condition as the elevation of instinct into a higher form of existence, you could argue that instead the very core and principle of what it means to be alive is that instinct becomes alienated from within itself. In fact, that the very idea of instinct becomes a kind of retroactive illusion, a fantasy that we wish we could inhabit because we would know how to act. This is of course the slightly reactionary element that exists within, I'm gonna turn off the light, that exists within people who say that we should go back to nature or that we should act in a manner befitting of our true pre-civilized intentions, that the root of all evil is that we've become detached from our natural selves. But the very idea of a natural self who lives in accordance with nature is itself a retroactive illusion that demonstrates that we fail to accept the reality that what it means to be human is precisely to be out of joint, to be uncomfortable, to exist in a kind of perpetual tension with ourselves and who we would like to be and where we think we belong and what we ought to do. Now that's the conceptual element of the Freudian idea of the uncanny which is that it relates to negation. It relates to the idea of repetition. Because what else is repetition if not negation with itself? Once you become stuck, once you repeat, you're not moving forward. You're existing in a loop that consumes itself. 
And yet the paradox of human existence, what Freud called the death drive, is precisely that we feel most alive when we're stuck like this. That it's precisely a human gesture, a human experience to be fruitfully stuck, to engage in the pursuit of the impossible delay of success and to revel in the process of failure. Now, one of the interesting things here, and I'm gonna make this a bit more philosophical in a moment, is that here we have the difference between, in psychoanalytic terms, desire and drive. Now, desire always revolves around an imaginary lack, a hole that we wish could be filled. For example, once I've achieved this goal in my life, I will feel like a complete person. Once I have an expensive car, I will feel good about myself. Once I have a partner, I will feel like I am worthy of being loved. Here we have desire. Desire revolves around the idea that something is lacking and that if it can be provided for, that this lack will disappear, that you will feel better. Drive, however, is the transposition of the empty object into the thing itself. Let me give you a more clear explanation of what that means. If desire revolves around the idea that there is something which will complete you, then drive is the positive entity of incompletion itself, a kind of constitutive negativity or a determinate negation. We can see the idea of drive, for example, within habit. Whenever human beings get stuck, whenever we do something repetitive, which is therefore pleasurable, whenever we start behaving like an automata, an uncanny robot, ironically, that's when we start feeling fulfilled and satisfied. It's like you could eat the same thing every day or you could have a journal in which you write down your calories or whatever goals you might have. If you go to the gym every single day and you see a slow progression and you, you, you calculate your movements into reps and sets, etc. Here we have the neurotic repetition, the Wiederholungszwang, the compulsion to repeat, that provides us with pleasure a more satisfying pleasure than desire. This is the funny thing, right? If you desire something, as soon as you have it, you risk losing your desire for it. It's a terribly painful experience. It can happen if you're in a relationship, for example, is you wanna be with that person so bad that once you're with them, you've almost lost your desire to have them which of course is not a good way to think about a relationship. Your partner shouldn't be an object of desire, someone who you think completes you. Instead, a relationship becomes healthy when it becomes a constant process of repetition, falling in love over and over again each and every day. Thereby, your relationship becomes happy once it becomes neurotic. You have to fall in love with your partner again and again in different ways that becomes a repetition, not something that completes you. The same thing happens with the pleasure that we experience in habit. Habit, which I think it was um, Chesterton who once joked that every free will is simply an act of habit. Every act of free will is an act of habit. Habit is forcing yourself to do something over and over again until you no longer have to think about it. It's like you could brush your teeth every day. It simply becomes something that you do you've kind of turned yourself into a puppet, an automaton, in which you're both the master and the puppet. You're simply doing something over and over again, and it provides you with satisfaction. This is the secret core of happiness that exists within routines. When you participate in a routine, the mere fact that you don't have to think about it provides you with some form of enjoyment. Hence also why the absence of routine, for example, whilst traveling, can be so destabilizing. You start losing your sense of self. 
because you're not doing the things that constitute your ordinary being. Now, of course, one of the things that happens, this is something you'll find within the critique of ideology and critique of capitalism, is that capitalism provides us with a master narrative, or if you will, a structure by which to order the chaos of our existence through a kind of pre-packaged habit. Hence also why one of the definitions of the critique of ideology is to say that ideology is that which gives order to the chaos of our desire. Think about it for a moment. Like one of the beautiful um, sort of contradictory objects of capitalist existence, at least in the United States, is the so-called Consumer Report. A Consumer Report is a magazine that is released in which consumer items are tested and ranked and compared. For example, it could be, you could have an issue of this magazine and it would have uh, 20 different cars or SUVs ranked, 20 different washing machines ranked and compared, 20 different, I don't know, uh, uh, insurance providers ranked and compared. What is presented to you as a valuable service of doing research so that you can make an informed purchase, what after all could be more definitive of the bourgeois mentality than to make sure that if you are going to purchase something, it has to be an informed and educated purchase because the worst thing could be reckless, spontaneous buying. However, the consumer report, and this is what's so interesting about it, provides you with its own form of surplus enjoyment, a kind of window shopping, which is that I have no intention of buying a washing machine. And yet I find it distinctly pleasurable for some bizarre, obscene reason to read about 20 different washing machines and how they compare. Here we have the difference between desire and drive. Desire would be, I need a washing machine to be fulfilled, to be happy. Drive is a, a rotating gesture, a kind of infinite loop around something which by its nature, very nature, cannot be fulfilled. I'm not going to buy a washing machine. And yet somehow I find it pleasurable to read about washing machines. Here we have the uncanny satisfaction that arrives from the drive. The satisfaction lies within the repetition itself. It's not a forward movement towards completion. It's not, I have a lack that has to be filled. I need a washing machine, so I will go and buy one. Instead, it's the neurotic, pleasurable obsession that derives from repeating one gestion that has by its very nature no completion. I am not going to buy a washing machine, and yet somehow I find it pleasurable to read about the ten, top 10 washing machines. Now, here we have, to make it a little bit more conceptual within psychoanalytic terms, the difference between the object of desire and the object cause of desire, which Lacan famously relates to the objet petit a. Now, the objet petit a, the little a, is therefore, and this is something that some people probably gloss over, a is autre, or other. It is the little other in relationship to, of course, the big other. And if you relate the idea of the big other to ideology, you can start seeing why ideology is that which gives structure to the chaos of our desire. Both the structure of teaching us what to want, in other words, how to desire, but also to give us what we truly desire, which is to never stop desiring. Hence, what happens within the ideology of contemporary life, consumer society, late stage capitalism, is that we are giving uncanny, we are given uncanny objects of pure repetition. For example, the iPhone. For example, the iWatch. For example, the iPad. There's something within the eye of iWatch and iPad and iPhone that distinctly resembles the un, the un, within das unheimliche, or the uncanny. Namely, the pure core, the real, if you will, that the pleasure lies not within the object, but within the empty mechanical repetition 
of the desire that is staged within the object as such. This is why people trade in their phones to receive another phone, which is mostly identical and yet has slightly different features. This is why you can buy 10 different brands of cereal that are mostly identical and yet with slightly different features. This is the objet a within lifestyle. Lifestyle is the beautifully paradoxical reality by which everyone within contemporary life lives more or less the same way. And yet through minute differences, we signify our loyalties, our allegiances, our pop culture. Are we team, I don't know, team Slytherin or team Gryffindor? Through these false choices, these empty differences, we therefore signal or stage our own individuality. And of course, what could be more conformist today than to desperately try to signal your individuality? And so what happens is that in the transition between desire and drive, we stage a transition between a movement towards the object which we think we completes us, towards the celebration of incompleteness itself, which is therefore constitutive, which is therefore a constitutive negativity. Not just negation between things, but the empty circling around negation as such, incompletion as such. Failure raised to the sublime entity of the success of being perpetually failed. You could also see this within what used to be called melancholy. Melancholy isn't simply the loss of the object of desire. For example, let's say you're in a relationship and you lose your loved one. This will cause you pain, but it won't make, make you a melancholic. A melancholic is someone who, having lost the love of their life, falls in love with loss itself. In other words, someone who falls in love with their own pain, who holds on to their pain because what else is left after your loved one has gone but the relic of your love, which is your pain. In other words, the empty space that they leave behind becomes a shrine for everything which you have lost. And so the uncanny element within melancholy, which prevents forward movement, like Gramsci once said, the old, the old has died, but the new cannot yet be born, is that you're holding on to the loss and you've turned it into a positive entity. In other words, what the melancholic does is that rather than loving someone or even loving himself, the melancholic loves loss itself, has positivized an empty space and finds a kind of obscene pleasure within this idealization of the empty space that is left behind and therefore cannot move forward, becomes stuck in an infinite loop. Now, what's interesting here, and this is where I want to bring in Slavoj Žižek. Žižek makes an argument about the relationship between Kantian metaphysics and Hegelian idealism. Žižek's argument, and this will be a little bit more technical, but I'll try to explain it. Žižek's argument is that the transition from Kantian metaphysics to Hegelian idealism is the transition from desire to drive. Think about it. The Kantian metaphysical argument is that we cannot access the thing in itself, thus ding an sich. That if the metaphysical project, going all the way back to Plato, is to access truth, essence, pure form, the light outside the cave, then Kant says we can't do it. Why can we not do it? Well, because as soon as we think about pure form or essence, we've already turned it into a concept. Therefore, we have rendered it impure. It's a little bit like why Plato was against the idea of art. Plato didn't hate art. He didn't think it was a corrupting force that prevented you from being productive. 
Plato believed that if we're trying to get to the essence of things, that for example, to paint or sketch a picture of an apple wouldn't get you tr closer to the truth of apple. It would simply be a copy of what was already a copy, namely the form of apple in the world rendered into artistic form. For Plato, this would be a devolution in what ought to be an ascension upon a metaphysical ladder. Now, here we have desire, essentially. The central coordinates of desire are something is lacking, and I require it in order to complete me. This is what we see within <clears throat> traditional Kantian metaphysics. Although Kant is a little bit more clever than this, and I'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> Namely, the thing in itself, essence, pure form, cannot be reached. And so we are forever lacking. We are forever incomplete. This is also how you have to understand that Kant believed in the idea of the immortality of the soul. Because if we can't figure it out in our life, then we are doomed to keep on doing it beyond the grave, to try to access the essence beyond our life. Now, the reason that Kant is a bit more clever here is Kant isn't arguing simply, well, we can't, we can't reach essence, so it's impossible. He's not simply a pessimist. Kant is essentially arguing, <clears throat> excuse me, is that there's a constitutive tension within the idea of pure reason itself. That if essence is mediated by a concept, this means that reason functions as a form of negation, as a form of negativity, by which the very idea of essence becomes mediated through the human activity of reason. And so what Kant is pointing towards here, <clears throat> excuse me, is precisely this kind of sublime entity by which reason only presents itself to us as the impure depiction of the ideal. That the very notion of the ideal is therefore pre-corrupted, if you will, by its form. Now, what Hegel does is that Hegel essentially looks at what Kant presents as an immutable problem and says, what if this problem is in fact the solution? What if this failure to access the ideal is precisely how the ideal is made manifest? In other words, Hegel to put it in psychoanalytic terms, transposes the loss of the object into the object itself. Now you can start understanding why Zizek would make the argument that it requires psychoanalysis, ironically, to complete the Hegelian revolution apropos Kant. That Hegel, of course, had no idea what the objet a was, the object cause of desire, and yet made an argument that fundamentally stages it in its primordial form. Avant la lettre. Now, if the transition from Kant to Hegel mirrors the transition from desire to drive, we can see how the Kantian metaphysical proposal, namely the impossible filling out of the lack of essence, of pure form, is therefore hystericized into the pleasure of drive, namely the Hegelian dialectic. The Hegelian dialectic is that which has no completion. The Hegelian dialectic is that of essence and object not just revolving around each other, but being, strictly speaking, synonymous. Substance as subject is Hegel's famous aphorism by which he takes what hitherto had been the two antithetical poles of metaphysics and argues that they are two sides of the same coin. Now, to go back briefly to the uncanny, if the uncanny is therefore a mirror onto the fruitful necessity of humanity, which is an abstract way of saying that what makes us most human is precisely our compulsion to repeat, that what makes us most alive is precisely the death drive by which we stage a sort of inner death by embracing habit, that Therefore, subjectivity for Freud, and then for Lacan in the famous Bard subject, subjectivity is therefore precisely the embrace of the impossible 
achievement of being your true self, of escaping repetition and working in a kind of flow, a synologist combination between who you are and who you would like to be. And to then apply this argument to metaphysics, to say that within the Hegelian edifice, we have what appears to be a problem, namely the fact that we cannot reach the thing in itself because the thing in itself is mediated, i.e. negated, through reason, the concept of pure existence, essence, is therefore made impure by its very thought. For Hegel, therefore, becomes the dialectical necessity of its own unfolding, that the only manner in which it can be thought is precisely in its impurity, that, to put it in the terms of the sublime, what makes it pure is that it is impure, that what makes it a success is the repetition of its failure, that essence doesn't lie beyond the horizon of human reason, but lies only within its failure to be made manifest, which is human reason. Therefore, human reason is no longer simply an ineffectual tool, but precisely the vessel within which essence is staged in the being of its own failure, a paradoxical, sublime entity. Now, Zizek's argument is, therefore, <clears throat> that not only does the link from Kant to Hegel mirror the transition from desire to drive, namely from the empty object revolving around lack, namely essence, that which is lacking, which will complete us towards the positivization of this lack into its own object, namely the objet a, or the object cause of desire. Zizek also argues that what Hegel cannot think is the idea of an indivisible remainder, something excessive which escapes the dialectical unfolding. Here we have to, for one moment, go back to the objet petit a. For Lacan, the objet petit a is not the object of desire, but the object cause of desire, which is related to his famous formula <clears throat> of desire, namely, what we desire is not an object. What we desire is desire itself. In other words, what we wish for is precisely incompletion. That the most human form <clears throat> of enjoyment is precisely the failure to feel fully satisfied. This is why Zizek's rule, if you will, you know, rule for life, ha ha is enjoy your symptom. Your symptom is the fact that secretly you don't want to be happy. You don't want to achieve your desire. You want to remain unhappy. You want to remain blissfully lacking. You want to keep on going. You want it to never end. That the most human experience is not when we're caught up in the most necessary tasks for human existence, like eating and sleeping. The most human experience is when we get obsessed with something that seems to have no value, that seems to be meaningless. Like, I don't know, if, you, if you're a sports enthusiast, you get really excited about seconds on the clock and foul calls and points scored. These things mean nothing, and yet they mean everything. The human experience is therefore precisely not we are lacking and we need to be fulfilled. The human experience is we enjoy our lack. We enjoy our symptom, our incompleteness. One might even go so far as saying that we relish in our suffering, that being perpetually, fruitfully, on the other side of satisfaction is what makes us satisfied. And think about it, that's what creativity is. Creativity is, I can do better. I can write this again. I can draw more. I'm, I cannot express how I feel, and so I have to put it into song. This is what love is. Love is saying, 
not a list of things you like about your partner. Love is saying, I need to constantly reinvent what it means to be a good partner. I want to be a student of love. To teach isn't simply to give somebody a bullet point spreadsheet of what they ought to download into their brain. To teach is precisely to make people question that a successful teacher will have convinced the student that the teacher is himself a student. Not to have the answers, but to learn how to ask the right questions. That philosophy is therefore precisely impossible. Not pragmatic. Not useful. Cannot be easily summarized into, here's what you ought to be doing with your life. Philosophy is like picking at a scab and secretly enjoying it. Philosophy is like pulling out your own hair, which therefore mirrors existence as such. Nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody feels like they've got it right. Nobody truly believes that what they're doing has meaning. And it is this perpetual recognition of the necessity of staging this failure over and over again on your own terms that creates the satisfaction of existence. And so what happens here is that we're back at the Freudian uncanny. The Freudian uncanny is something which moves even though it ought not to move. The Freudian uncanny therefore mirrors a kind of impossible kernel of truth within our own being, which is to say, we are human precisely because we are not animals of instinct. What makes us most alive is precisely that we are out of joint, that we are stuck, that we embrace empty repetition, compulsive rep repetition. For what else is life? if not compulsive repetition over and over again. Trigger warning, because please do not kill yourself. But one of the ways in which suicidal ideation manifests is the desire to stop this empty repetition, to have a final moment of completion, to exert control. And yet the fundamental insight, what Lacan calls traversing the fundamental fantasy, is not to say, I wish I could take a break from life. I wish I could simply not be or stop being. But instead to say that this impossibility of stopping, of truly stepping outside the stuckness that you experience, is life in its highest form, is precisely what it means to be most human. And the philosophical argument that Zizek makes, which I'd like to one more time emphasize here, is that in the lineage from Kantian metaphysics, desire for the object that completes us, essence, pure form, and the transition to Hegelian dialectics, namely the transposition of the loss of the object into the object itself, we therefore have a missing third element a missing third element which Zizek dubs the necessity of psychoanalysis. Zizek's argument, a controversial one, of course, is that in the philosophical triad, it should be Kant, Hegel, Lacan. That we require the concept of the death drive and the concept of repetition compulsion the concept which derives from the Freudian idea of the uncanny, to understand how the transition that occurs from Kant to Hegel and Lacan, this is going to be very technical, is how we go from imminent negation within Kant, namely the impossibility of pure form because of the problem of reason, towards determinate negation within Hegel, namely the positing of a constitutive negativity within this impossibility itself, a kind of sublime unfolding of spirit, which Hegel deems the dialectic, towards the Lacanian 
indivisible remainder, the real, by which we go from imminent negation to determinate negation to the negation of negation. Therefore, Lacan stages that the only positive form of existence is precisely negation which revolves around itself. That there is no positive content to being, no true authentic subject, save for the recognition of the ever impossible, ever fruitful, irreconcilable, indivisible element, namely the truth of subjectivity, which is that subjectivity is the site of pure repetition. Subjectivity equals pure repetition. Repetition, not just between things, but repetition within itself. Negativity elevated to the level of the sublime. That is Zizek's argument. And hence why Zizek argues that it requires Lacan to understand Kant and Hegel. Thank you guys so much. I love that you stuck with me. Thank you for being here. Um, one quick message, housekeeping. I can only host these lectures because of patrons, patrons like yourself. This is not good content. This is not something that works as a 30 second video. I find this stuff hugely enriching and exciting. And I want to share that passion with you but the only way that I can do that is due to the generous support of patrons who get it. Patrons who understand this project and what we're trying to do together. To create a space online in which philosophy and theory can exist without dumbing it down. And so if you'd like to support me in this project, please consider becoming a patron. Starts at $5. We have a wonderful community of people who are into this stuff. But if you'd really like to support the project, you can also purchase my ebook, which is based on my lectures, which is available for another two weeks on Patreon before it disappears. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you on behalf of everybody joining us from around the world. And if you can join us on Patreon, please consider it. We have a wonderful community, and I am so excited that I get to share my enthusiasm for philosophy and theory with you. Thank you guys so much for being here. And if you'd like to join us on Patreon for as little as $5 a month, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Jenneline and Julian, and I will post the link. Thank you guys. And for the patrons, we're gonna be going live on Discord in five minutes for another hour of Q and A's. See you soon. Bye-bye.